Okay, and then, uh, Sedrosna, did you see that con- I did- Hey, how's it going? We can hear you. Yeah, yeah, it's going- Yeah, it's going nice, John. So- Am I audible? Yes, you are audible. Uh, yeah, John, I saw that. Uh, like, you tagged another uh, PR. Uh, oh, that was, oh, that, that's, I added another comment since then. Um, oh, okay. Let's see. Uh, okay. I'll give, I don't know if Agen has yeah, time to join today, but we'll give him another minute. I think I saw the comment that you added. Yeah, uh, the Git repo checkout, the removing node thing. Yeah, yeah. I, I modified that as well. Okay, sweet. Yeah. Uh, let's see. Man, we that stupid TensorFlow thing. I've been rerunning this pull request on the CI several times a day. The only thing that I'm thinking at this point is, you know, why don't I try it locally, actually? That might help. Um, let's see. So... So plugin equals model TensorFlow um, CI run. No, whatever you say. Apps. What do you mean it's already installed? Uh, no, because it's Python 3.7. God damn it. Okay. Uh, um, failing command. God damn it. Uh, how does this work? Uh, it worked on my other computer. Uh, Alright, I'll have to figure out how to do that later. Um, oh, yeah, and I have more news. Okay, so let me just, I'm trying to get everything in together in the meeting minute stocks here so we can kind of just run through it. Uh, oops. Okay, okay. sweet. All right, well, I think, um, okay, Agen's here. Sweet. All right, so yeah, um, we can start, get started for today. Let me just run through the things that I, uh, we have going so far. Um, so we got that message from that one person um, saying that we have bad doc strings or non-existent doc strings. Um, so that's an issue. Um, and I have created two issues to track that. Um, one of them is that everything needs doc strings, basically. Um, and basically, I did that. The first thing I did that for was the SQL stuff that Agen added. So I went through and I added the doc strings for it. Um, and basically, it'll end up looking like this. And I'll show you. Here's the preformat, or here's the version in. Let's see. Here's what it looks like in the source code. Um, it's basically, you say what the parameters are, you give the data types and some description of them, and then you say what the return values are. Um, so pretty simple stuff. Um, the other thing that we'll need to do is like the example code too. Um, I don't know if I had that on here yet. Um, oh no, that's AIO helpers. Um, oh, I guess util's not on here. Um, okay, well, that's a bummer. Um, maybe I can build it and show you guys real quick. Uh, or, nah, okay, I'll just push it. I'll just push it. But so some of them have the doc test examples. So this is the other issue. So the first one is basically we need to go through and document it in this format right here. And this is sort of like, as you find things, if you're looking for something that would be great to do, um, if you want to just go through a few of the functions that you know, or methods that you know, and add doc strings for them, it's not the most exciting thing in the world. Um, but it gets a little more exciting when you write the test for them and do the doc test stuff. Um, because then we can add, like, I'll show you. Um, this is always fun. Um, well, okay, my version of fun is, is, uh, is somewhat subjective but <laughs> so let's see um let's see till 
Okay, and I believe I added them to data update doc string examples. Okay, so these are the doc string examples, right? And they're basically just like a tiny unit test, or well, they, you know, you show, this is the, the stuff like when you go on the Python documentation, um, uh, where would it be, library? Um, so yeah, when they show things like this with the little arrows, that it's it means like you know if you were doing this in the Python interpreter, and then the next line without the arrows is what the output should be. So you can run the doc test module, and it will basically go through all of the documentation strings for a given file, and check that they. Um, it will check that they are, you know, when you run the thing on the line with the three arrows, it outputs what was on the line below. Um, and so what I did was I just went through and I, I updated them for this data file because she was confused about what this stuff was doing. Um, so, because it was the doc strings were not correct. Um, so basically, now if you go and you run the doc test command on this file, and I can show you guys how that works real quick here. Um, uh, come on. Nope, I guess not that command, right? 3.7 m doc test. Let me make this a little bigger here. Uh, change settings. Appearance. Okay, so doc test, DFFML util data. Okay, you want to give me some output? Did I do something funny? Maybe V? Okay, yeah, All right, so you have to do it with dash V. Um, so basically, it goes through and it tries to run. Let me find one that was the one that we were looking at here. Um, okay, yeah, traverse config git, and that was make these side by side. Sorry. Um, okay, or right, that's traverse config set. All right, so it goes through and it tries to run this line here, um, and so it runs whatever's here, and then you have to put little dot dot dots just like the whatever would happen in the in the interpreter. If it shows dot, dot, dots, you need to put dot, dot, dots there um, to continue the statement. Um, and then it compares the output. So it says trying, expecting, and it got what it was expecting exactly. So it, this string here matched. And so all is well. Um, and the doc test paths, passes. Um, so what we'll try to do is we need to try to go through and and obviously, this one I didn't document the arguments, so it's it's not it's nothing is nothing is as it should be right now. But that's the point of these issues. So we'll go through, and if you have extra time or looking for random things to do, uh, this will be great because then people will see on the the documentation website it'll be really obvious as people are going through they won't have to read the source code they can just you know know what stuff to call because um, we all have had to read all the source code. Um, so, yeah, okay, so that's basically the deal with this, um, and it comes out nicely formatted like this, and if you add the example, the example will also come out nicely formatted, so people can just copy-paste from the documentation website here um, the examples, and that will be super helpful for them. And, yeah, so that is the first bullet point that I wanted to talk about. Um, and then the pre-trained model stuff, um, uh, Himachu and I are banging our heads against why TensorFlow is installing in one. The funny thing is that it's installing when we go through and we look at, okay, so, and I'm pretty sure it has to do with this virtual envi stuff, actually, um, at this point, but I can't prove it yet. So we've changed, Himachu went through and, and moved all the TensorFlow 1 stuff to TensorFlow 2 and found this wonderful log level thing to make it so that we don't have to view all those stupid logs that don't get through the logging infrastructure that Python has. And then we bump the version here, but but the... I, 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 I tried with RC2 also, it's not working for this also. Oh, I bet. <laughs> yeah. So, so, but the funny... I, I have no idea. Yeah, I have no idea too, right? Right now, it's like, it's. I think it has to do with that pip version, and I think what it is is... Okay, let's see here. One second. CI run. All right, so 
When we set up the, when we run one of the plugins, the first thing we do is like create a virtual environment, activate the virtual environment, and install pip. Install the upgraded version of pip. So like this shouldn't be a problem at all. It should be just fine. Now, that's where I'm getting confused here because we activate the virtual environment, we install pip, and then we run the tests, and then, and so this. So this is where it's failing in here. It's like, okay, it's in the virtual environment. It installed the upgraded version of pip, and it ran the tests. But now the thing is, it goes into the plugin and runs the tests. And now, and then the thing is, that on the main plugin, what it does is it goes, it does this stuff in the virtual environment. It runs the test. Then it tries and run all these like other things that we have that aren't necessarily tests, as well as like the longer tests that that require some of the um, the integration tests that require other plugins um, and the examples. And it does some of that. It deactivates the virtual environment, and then to install the docs, we kind of clear. We deactivate the virtual environment, so we're like we're back in a clear area. Um, Install the plugins again and run the scripts, or and run the run the doc scripts and run the coverage report for everything as well as the integration tests. Um, which again, I don't know if you saw. I just found an issue that basically this line here checks if any of the integration tests are being skipped, and then bails if they did get skipped. Um, well, that's why uh, that was not showing any of it. Yeah, exactly. Because. Yeah, it checks if they're skipped. It doesn't check if they erred. <laughs> um, so we also need to add a line, and I'm pretty sure it's just if. Uh, pretty sure it's just error equals star. Um, but you know we need to check that. Um, and so somewhere in here, like when we're running any of these tests here, for example, uh, let's see. Well, okay, so this one is in. The virtual environment it doesn't require any of the tensorflow tests to do the integration examples i wonder if we're hitting the same issue here actually we're probably hitting the same issue here let's just look at the zoom 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 unzoom okay Let's see. Uh, this is the same. This is the same error that we were. This is the one that's fixed. But see, I was expecting, I was kind of expecting that we were okay here. Or, well. Okay, yeah, this is. Okay, this is what I was talking about. It's installing TensorFlow correctly here, which is where we're not able. Like we're failing on the install in the other one, right? Then that's that's the problem. Yeah, yeah. It, it's unable to find. Yeah. It's unable to find find on pipeline. Yeah, and in this in this when we're running the main test and we install all of the, um, ooh, when we're running the main test and we install everything. Let's see. This is right after the test config loader stuff. So that's here, um, where we're creating the last, where we create the config loader here, um, and then we run that, and then we run this, and when we run service dev install, this is still in the virtual environment. So that, that makes less sense, because that doesn't make any sense at all then. So I guess this is still an open issue. I was hoping we might figure it out right now, but that doesn't, that's complete nonsense. What the hell? Um, yeah, I don't know. I guess I'm not sure. Oh, oh, maybe. Okay, here, this might be it. We activate the virtual environment. We install pip and twine. We run the install on the root, which is the main package. Then we run the tests. So, okay, okay, I better know what's going on here. All right, so we don't actually install the package because you don't need to install packages to test them, and you shouldn't. You shouldn't need to. But my guess, what happens when you install, when you run the tests, is you'll see uh, like downloading to the .eggs directory where it downloads the dependencies locally um, to the 
whatever your path is that you're running the test from, wherever setup.py is, it'll create this directory called .eggs, and it'll install the packages in there and then use those packages for the tests. Now, this is where like setup tools and distutils and pip are all sort of like loosely combined, but also the same thing, but also not. My guess is whatever's in charge of installing dependencies to the .eggs directory for tests does not know how to install the correct, like it, it's using the old version of pip or something, the version of pip that didn't get upgraded. So if we add the install, we'll probably be okay. Um, install. Okay. This will probably work because that's the difference here that I'm seeing right now is we're installing the package first using the regular pip command. This one is not installing the package. It's just running the tests and installing the packages with whatever whatever runs the test has a different thing way of installing the packages than pip would uh, if we did it uh, for real. Um, so let's try that and see what happens. So install u test, okay. Um, and I wonder if we, we should probably just uninstall just to be safe because down here we're going to do things that, that, that will be weird. So, um, okay, let's just, let's try this and see what happens while we continue with our meeting. So try installing package before running tests. All right, let's see what happens to that. I, I'm optimistic that that will fix things. <laughs> um, okay, so, and then, so the SQL op stuff, I still haven't gotten to the export stuff. Sorry, I was working on, uh, I was working on uh, the web UI. I wanted to get that started. I'm trying to get that to a place pretty soon here. I'd like to get it to a place, uh, there's one thing that I need to fix that I'll talk about at the end, um, but I want to get that to the place where we can start accepting contributions on that. Um, because that's going to be cool. Um, and so, but I'm going to get to the SQL op stuff. I have some stuff at work that I'm being hounded for, um, other projects that are higher priority to other people, um, that are being, that I'm being hounded for to do. Um, so I need to get those done and that's where I've sort of, uh, haven't been able to work as much. So sorry about that, but I'll get, I'll get the export stuff soon. Um, so the repo feature specific predictions, again, we got, uh, he contributed that, we got that merged, that was great. So now basically what we'll see is, um, let's see, I believe there oh, should uh, be. I think uh, then Himanshu should, uh, might want to change. He's working on TensorFlow models right now, right? Oh, yeah. Oh yeah, that might that might screw things up. Yeah, okay. So well, when we when we merge that stuff, um, once we figure out the TF one to two thing, then once you, yeah, because the way that the predict method, the repo dot predict predicted yeah. method changed. Um, I think change. I don't think it will be an issue. But it's yeah, it, it's it's a it's a minimal minimal thing. So, oh, did we not merge that? I thought we merged that. Oh, we didn't merge it. Let's see. Is it done? Yeah. Okay, cool. Let's see. I'm sorry. I must, uh, must have not seen. Let's see. Minor changes. Okay, and then you fixed it. Great. All right. Um, yeah, perfect. Let's just merge this right now then. Um, checks. Okay. Uh, oh, wait. Something's wrong. Cool. It may have been something from the recent changes that I think it sometimes rebases changes on top. Okay, modified key confidence. Oh, okay, okay. Uh, that's not accessing the default key and if I, I'll fix it. Okay, cool. All right, yeah, let's 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 take these things off and add it to the change log. And then when you're done, uh, remove the WIP tag. Um, and that way I'll... It'll it'll signal to me that I need to come check at it again, or just ping me in the issue. Okay. Um, let's see. Okay, so let's let's. Okay, I, for some reason I thought we'd merge that. Um, probably because it, it looked it looked done when I last looked at it, except for those things. So I, 
I just thought we'd done it. Okay, so this is will be done soon. Um, IDX3 stuff. I think um, Saksham has been busy. Uh, I haven't heard from him. I mean, we heard from him last week, and he said he was super busy. Uh, I know people are going into midterms and stuff right now, so that's probably what's going on. Um, but yeah, that's so that's same as last week. Uh, I pushed up the source, actually. Um, it is published because I had to do some stuff. I had to put in some keys, and I was going to lose access to the settings page because they only give us temporary access. So the source is actually up there. You can install it, um, but it's not merged into master. Um, so we just need to get the few things that we wanted for the documentation there, and then it'll be good. Um, the info validation uh, that Augen's doing, so that's very similar to the spec stuff that um, Sudarsan is doing. Um, and so that is basically, it's, it's almost, it's, it's very similar type of thing. The idea here was basically that when these inputs come in the network, um, we want to validate the data types. So, and the tests do a good job of illustrating what's going on with that. So basically what we'll have here is if you say that uh, shape name is, uh, you know, if you say that shape name is a string um, and you want to do some validation on that, you might say, okay, like any anything that becomes a shape name needs to be a uppercase it needs to be all uppercase right and so then the validation function will return the same thing but uppercase um, and for example pi well if you try to input a number as pi and the number does not equal 3.14 well we should raise the validation uh, input validation error which is the which is the only other thing to do on this um, and then uh, so yeah, this came about from uh, somebody, I was getting some security review from one of my buddies on the security team the other day and he was saying, oh, have you have you done all the input validation? I was like, well, the beautiful thing about this is we can trace all the inputs. Um, and so we can very easily do input validation. And this is going to be very exciting from like a security perspective of, of you know, you can build, it, when someone comes to you and says, uh, have you validated all your inputs which is basically like what everyone around my work hates to hear it's because that's what we ask them on the security i'm on the security team and we ask people constantly have you validated all your inputs and the answer is like no i mean how would you know if I, how would i know if i validated all my inputs well if you're doing stuff with this data flow programming style of things like we can we can know if we validated all our inputs because nothing can get to any of our code until it's been validated now um so it's it's very exciting uh it will relieve lots of headaches for anybody who wants to do this um and so and then the spec stuff is in the same vein obviously but we've talked about that before um so and that's that's it's like the layer before the input validation or well it's also part of the input validation is we're doing anything that's a dictionary that should have certain keys um, we're using those specs to convert uh, the dictionary into its named tuple value or you know whatever the spec is um, some kind of class that actually takes those parameters and that way you can know you know you don't sometimes you access uh, right so if we tried to access repo directory and that key didn't exist we would throw an error in this function now what's going to happen is as soon as you try to input something into the network that should be of that data type it's going to validate that it has a directory parameter so it won't even let it get in there unless it's correctly formatted so we will know that things will work uh, as they come in and then of course this validation the way that that got added is it's going to get added um, right after this spec conversion so then you could validate the different fields in the spec if you wanted to um so this is very very exciting stuff i'm thrilled about it um everybody else with security background will be thrilled about this um but it may not seem that exciting <laughs> um uh, john uh, yeah. can you take the uh, build log for that particular pr there's yes. one particular uh, lint check that is failing mm -hmm. and uh, i'm not sure like uh, what mm. is it what is it exactly do oh oh this was the docs this is a relatively new one uh, i think what happened what happens here is we ensure that the documentation is being updated so the docs folder so you have to run the documentation generation script um, yeah okay so if you just run uh, actually, I think everything's already installed. So if you just run dot slash scripts uh, slash docs dot sh um, and then commit the changes and push those up, that should be good. Um, so yeah. 
Um, oh, okay, sure. I think in Gitpod everything is automatic. I think every all the plugins should have been installed already. So I think if you just run the scripts, the docs script, it will update them, and you'll you'll see the changes in that file. Okay, sure. I'll do that. Thank cool. you. I heard somebody saying something. Uh, yeah, John, it failed again. It's a problem with the PHP again. Oh, still? Uh, uh, it's saying uh, you must give at least one requirement to install. Something to do with the dot that you put. I think. Oh. Oh, it's probably because dash u and dot don't go together. Because, like, you can't really update a package that's just exists. Um, let's just do dash e and let's see what happens. All right, cool. Um, uh, and then Yash, he's been working on trying to clean up the feature stuff, but I don't, I don't really know what's going on there. I, he hasn't been super active recently. Um, that would be great though, because we've got a lot of these unused methods that are hanging around from the very and the very initial implementation didn't do data flow stuff. Um, it had this very uh, it was it was not a great way of generating feature data. You had to deal with all this locking and stuff that was not fun, and that's that's why the data flow stuff is nice, is because you don't have to deal with locking. Um, let's see, uh, what else do we got here? Oh. Um, Justin is working on this auto args and config. He's basically, there's a few more files where um, we, we haven't finished going through and uh, and removing the args and config method and replacing them with the config decorator. So he's still in progress on that. Um, let's see, uh, what else do we got? Let me just make sure we've gone through all the pull requests. Um, uh, I'm improving the quick start at some point here and then I need to do the, uh, uh, export here, which I started doing that this morning. Hopefully, I'll get to it today. Um, all right, cool. I think we're pretty much gone through all the pull requests. Uh, is there anything else that, or what? What else do you guys want to talk about here before I sort of give you a little? I can I can do the demo of the web UI, or why don't why don't we talk about everything you guys have to talk about first? Because there's not that much to talk about with the web UI. So I guess is everybody is everybody got um, you know. If you want something to work on, do you have something to work on, or are you blocked on anything that we don't know about that you're blocked on? I have nothing to work. <laughs> okay, <laughs> cool. Okay. Um, let's see. So you've got mad model skills here. So um, what else did we have that was going with the models? Oh, this could be very interesting. This is something that Rahul yeah. was talking about. I've been this. Yeah. Did you see that? Have you played around with this yet? Yeah, yeah. I, okay. I'm just learning this. I found this is really fast. Like I didn't. Oh know yeah, this. that's what I heard. Yeah. This is this is really fast. Yeah. So apparently, apparently, this is like. So Rahul was telling me this thing has been around for a long time. It was made by Yahoo back in 2007, and yeah. uh, and apparently this had been like the gold. This continues to be like the gold standard for machine learning. It's just like TensorFlow gets a lot of hype. Um, and so apparently this is like what people really love to use in production. It's very battle tested and really awesome. Um, so this would be really cool. And so the thing about this is what we'll end up doing here is we'll, I think it's a command line interface or they have, okay, they have Python. Okay. Let's see. Um, okay. Let's see. Let's see. Where is, I don't see any Python code here. Um, I'm still not seeing any Python code. <laughs> I clicked Python, did I not? Okay, let's see, language Python, or no. Oh, it's just telling you how to install it, okay. So it's all through the command line. Let's see, see command line, see Python tutorial. Okay, this is the Python tutorial. Okay, now it's in Python. All right, okay. So, here's the deal. This is, okay, so the interesting thing, so the thing about DFFML is we're running everything in these async functions, right? Um, and this is great for doing IO. It's not great if you have a machine learning model that's blocking the main thread. Um, now, 
the thing about most of the machine learning frameworks is they don't understand async, right? So the the reason why async is nice is because we can stream data in and properly handle um, network errors and network issues and, and just like networking networking is done correctly with async and await. Um, and so when you're when you're building these large like uh, when you're doing the data flow networks and stuff and you've got all this data flying around and some of it's coming in from external sources it's a huge pain if you don't use the async and await stuff you can do it lots of people do it it's just it breaks all the time and i consider that to be a pain i don't i don't want things to break um so if you're okay with things breaking every once in a while and getting timeout errors then it's fine but if you're not then you want to use async and await so we're using async and await for that reason now the problem is obviously it blocks it, you can't anything cpu bound will block the event loop now anything and, and, and machine learning algorithms and the usage of, you know, whether you're going out to the GPU or not, all that stuff is, is, is hogging the CPU um, as it, you know, shoves things in and out of memory of the GPU or whatever, right? Um, so the nice thing about Wopal Rabbit is that we can launch it as a sub-process and then we can uh, feed the data in through its standard input and that way it will run in a separate it will run in a separate process, which is even better than a separate thread, because Python has that thing called the so Python has this thing called the global interpreter lock, and the reason why Python is so easy to use and everything is because we have this global interpreter lock, and it makes it makes all sorts of things easier. The bad thing about it is that anytime you want to do multi-processing or multi-threaded code, you have to jump through a bunch of hoops. Um, and so if we start a sub-process and we just feed the data in, async we can asynchronously feed the data into the sub-process, which is, you know, we like that um, because we're asynchronously reading the data from various sources. Um, so it would be very cool if uh, we could figure out how to do this um, using their command line client. So basically call out using the sub-process um, uh, the various sub-process that it, commands in async io so let's see in uh where is that tutorials new operations tutorial um, safety operation okay so these guys are examples of that um in the should i uh example program that we create um we do this async io create sub process exec and actually in the git features too but we basically just we it creates a sub process and then we use we say that we want to use pipes unix pipes um to communicate with it and so then we can read and write data from those pipes and so what we'll end up doing here is basically doing that async for repo and repos and then uh std in dot write and then you know whatever the format is that the repo data should be in to that sub process um and this way we can we 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 sidestep the global interpreter lock by writing. We make it. We make the. We take a CPU bound problem and we make it into an I/O I/O bound problem again. Um, and so this will be very cool um, because you could run multiple machine learning models without blocking the main thread and without having to do funky tricks with memory and things like that um, to get the data into the model in another thread while reading from the main thread things like that um eventually we'll figure that stuff out but it's going to be it's it's going to be kind of heavyweight uh stuff to figure out um so this would be cool to see to get this experience of uh, or like to allow users to have this experience where they can very easily like they could be running multiple models within one data flow right and everything is still working because the main thread is not blocked um did that all make sense or yeah, it's yeah, yeah, it's making, but I I will get back to it yeah. I start using it. <laughs> yeah, cool. Yeah, so definitely, yeah, play around and and see how it goes, and and then let us know. Um, but yeah, it looks like you know they've got some sort of input format. So we'd basically just be doing you know repo dot features, and then taking the features and converting to them to whatever this input format is. They have this contextual bandit reinforcement learning, right? You can see. So this has a quite. Uh, it, it has a better Python interface. Yeah. Uh, most of them are uh, otherwise they are like CLI based. Okay. So yeah. So, so so we can do that first at least. Nice. Yeah. Yeah. And and obviously yeah the Python interface will be great too because eventually we'll figure out 
we'll 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 have a good way to do the uh, splitting splitting the models into another thread. Um, but for now, we'll probably just want to do like it. It would be great if if you wanted to start adding a, a new model from a new framework to do this um, to do this with the Python stuff, and then you know the the point of that conversation was really just if you wanted to try using the subprocess stuff too, we could see how it works when it gets when it goes async because um, it would be interesting to see see what happens uh, from the data flow perspective where we've got like a bunch of these models making predictions at the same time or something. Um, it'll just be it'll be fun to watch, right? A uh, bunch okay. of things happening at the same time. <laughs> it'll be fun to watch. It'll be fun to watch is one way to put it. It'll be very cool and useful is another way, right? Because if you have say like a bunch of uh, frames, so. so so the other reason why this stuff is all async is because you know reality is asynchronous, right? So if I have a bunch of frames coming in from uh, some camera somewhere, I would like to, or like from a bunch of cameras, I'd like to dispatch all of them to some inference model, right? And then it, uh, all the camera sources come into the data flow, and then one of the operations is run the inference, and then you know store that in a SQL database or something, right? And so if we've got one one of these as a prototype that could do actually run this stuff in parallel. We could see all of those inferences just happening very fast, and it would be it would be awesome, right? Um, I want to do. I think one of the fun things that would be that would be fun to do is to take the stuff that we've been doing, like with well, we'll have the web UI, right? But that'll be kind of just like focused on. Um, you know, actually interacting with the FML just like the command line, but basically, it'll basically just be a web UI version of the command line stuff, right? Where we're like train predict accuracy data sources um, and then set up data flows. But it would be cool to do, and I think we talked about this before, but like a little demo app where we basically have a data, or we, we take some input data, like, and we train a model, and then we have like a a demo app and I was thinking you know the the handwritten digit data set might be a good one for this where we could go and we could just uh, we could have like a little a, a web page that captures the video and every time you know every frame it converts it to an image so you can like hold your phone over a piece of paper with some digits drawn on it and every time the frame changes it uh, converts or it takes the frame as an image, sends it to the data flow on the server that's running the prediction for the NIST um, data set, and sends you back what is the text representation of that digit, right? Um, so that would be a very, very easy little demo app that we could do, um, and we can think of more things like that, right? Um, but it'll be, it'll be fun to put those sorts of things together. Um, I mean, we've already got all the pieces here. We just need to go do that type of thing, you know, the final final demo app sort of things. Um, but yeah, uh, cool. So do, yeah, if you want to do that, that would be that would be sweet. Does that sound like something, or else I can dig up some other things? Yeah, I, I will try to do this. Sweet, yeah, sweet. This. Yeah. Okay. okay cool. Um, and then, so Agen, did you want to do that? I mean, I know I, I sort of just threw that at you because uh, you know I think I think that that would be an interesting one for you to do. You're gonna learn. You're gonna learn some cool stuff doing this. Um, but we can find yeah, something I'll else if you'd rather. I'll I'll let you know in the day because I still haven't gotten around. Yeah. For sure, for your sure, that sounds good. And I then was just watch, uh, I don't know what over this, so I was just watching a video on YouTube. Yeah, yeah. So this is going to be basically so the web UI or the the so the web UI is going to be like it's it's a React app um, that will stand up basically on the documentation website, or you could stand it up yourself somewhere. Um, but you basically just and and this is now is a good time for me to show this, I guess. Um, but so you, you, you go to the web UI and it says, okay, hey, you know, this is just a web interface that requires a backend service, right? But we'll, we have a demo mode where it'll do all fake data and stuff. Um, so then what you would do is you would do the DFFML um, uh, service dev HTTP. Uh, you would do this command right here server and then you wouldn't do insecure um but you know you would you would start it correctly um which would be this command so you would you know run that on some server or what you could even do is what well, this is going to be really fun is is uh so with gitpod you could you can start um http services or just any service and it will forward the port so if somebody doesn't even have access to a machine like they can just go on gitpod run this command and then 
paste the URL that Gitpod gives them into this uh, into the web UI here, and they won't even have to have anything set up locally, and they'll just you know be able to start using all of the stuff that we've been working on. Um, I think that would be very cool. Um, and so, actually, I think I already have that linked. Yes, good. Um, so yeah, then you just put in the URL and you'd hit save. Obviously, I haven't finished doing that yet, but this is the main thing that needs to happen first. Like I was talking about, this is what needs to happen first before we can really start accepting contributions because I need to figure out how to propagate this URL once it's changed through all the different pages so that they make cor so that they make requests to the correct backend when you change the backend URL or set it from demo mode to an actual URL. Um, but yeah, so they'll go through in here, and you know, then this is the this is the upload interface. So the way it's structured right now, and, and this is where we'll need some feedback. But you've got your sources, you've got your models, you've got your operations, and your data flows. Um, so obviously, step one is you know you upload your data, and then here's like the list. For some reason, the icons aren't working, but this shows you the folders and the data or the files in the folders. Um, and none of the other pages work right now. But so you'd upload your data, you'd configure your sources. So you'd say, okay, I want a CSV source or I want a MySQL source. And then you, you know, all the, this is, this is why all this config stuff is very important because it serializes it all. Um, it allows us to serialize that all so that we can then present it in different formats like the web UI. So we can basically auto create forms that will populate the different fields of those config structures. Um, and so then you'll be able to configure the source and you'll be able to you know look through all the data and the various sources that you have configured then you go to the model page and you configure your model you know you say okay these are the features that I want and here's the data source or here's the uh, uh, you know here's there's here's the various parameters that I want number of uh, epics and number of steps and things like that like we've been doing on the command line you want to train the model then you're gonna say okay here's the model that I want to use that I've configured and here's the sources that I want to use that I've configured all the same stuff we'll just you know we'll have a nice UI for it um, and then of course the operations and the data flows is going to be a little bit more complicated to make UIs for um, but there was this pretty cool um, uh, let's see this library which I think is going to be really nice um, for making the the uh, um, the data flow stuff. So this this looks awesome, um, and it looks kind of like there's some similar products out there that somebody demoed this of or like created this as an example of. Um, but they don't do they they do sort of like things that are not what we're doing. Um, but ours is very generic, right? So we can we'll end up doing whatever at some point. But so yeah, the idea would be these would be the operations, right? And then you click on it. They've already got most of the code, right? So this is great. Um, we can pretty much just go and start using their thing. Um, but yeah, um, so this is this will be helpful. We can probably hopefully embed this somewhere, right, um, within the data flow creation. Uh, but yeah, so that's what the web UI is shaping up to look like. Um, and as soon as I figure out how to do that, uh, setting the the back end. Um, will be ready to go for everybody to just jump on different parts of this and start start working on it if you if you want to do javascript uh if that's if that's your thing or other people i'm sure that 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 don't know how to do python but want to be involved in the javascript side of things they might jump on this um but i think this is going to be really cool because you know this makes it so that people who don't uh we could even have something where it's like hey you know stand this up on your uh google uh google compute gives uh, free serverless. I think you get a million free serverless calls um, just just per year. Um, so we could set something up so like uh, it would work. The back end could be hosted off the serverless functions of Google Compute. So people could have like, you know, a million free API calls in a year. So they could do most of this like without having to set anything up at all. Um, but yeah, so things are, things are really shaping up. I think that... Uh, We've made a lot of good progress here in the past few months too, and so so getting getting uh, getting people a little bit more of a flashy flashy uh, marketing type things will will help. I've been talking to some people, and they said, you know, if if I can come up with some uh, marketing materials, uh, they can start helping helping like get the word out more. Um, so I might be trying to come up with some marketing materials and things, but you know that usually involves uh, sort of screenshots, right? So that's why. 
I'm trying to get the UI going. So hopefully we get some more traffic, more stars, more people using this, um, obviously, because it's helpful. So, <laughs> but yeah, that's where that's where things are at with me. And uh, yeah, any questions on any of that, or any questions for me, or anything else? I think we might end early today, just a little bit. Uh, is John? Uh, uh, Okay, you go ahead. Okay, so I think it it installed the TensorFlow, but there is some problem with uninstalling it. Saying it then. Oh Jesus! Yeah, yes, there is. <laughs> it didn't like that. Okay. Um. Oh. Oh yeah, it's because it you need the package name to uninstall. Okay, I'll fix that. Okay, yeah. Sudarsana. Yeah, John. So the I ran the scripts uh, slash docs dot sh, mm -hmm. but then again, uh, it's it's saying like it needs to local changes to the following files would be overwritten by checkout, and it's listing the files that uh, got changed. Did you uh, did you push up those changes? Yeah, I did. Huh. Let's see. Uh, do 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 do. Oh, I know what it is. It's because we removed the spec from group by because that's actually a dict with the dict inside it. Um, oh, it deleted the model file. That's, I think, what's happening now. Um, okay, yeah, because this was the only thing that should have changed. So maybe one of those is not installed. Let's see. Oh, I think you have to might, might have to merge master and then do rerun... Yeah, I think. Um, oh, but I just now like pulled the changes from master. Uh, okay, I think I know what it is. I think you have to run the service dev install command. Oh wait, did I run that? Um, no, I told you not to run that. I'm sorry. I thought it was already done. They should have already been done. Let me check. I swear that uh, this is being done by the. Uh, by the git pod file, but yeah, no, see, I think I ran around. the pip install of minus u dev. Okay, yeah, I mean, try running the service dev install command. See, the thing is, the reason why I told you not to run that is because when git pod starts up, it's supposed to do this command here, oh, the service dev okay. install, which should have gotten everything right it, it, it we yeah. shouldn't what's what's happening here is when you generated the docs some of the plugins were not and were not discovered which means they were not installed um yeah. so somehow somehow the installation got wiped out for some of the plugins which is odd but you know it just happens sometimes it's yeah, sure. it's yeah especially if you do like get clean or things like it'll just get messed up so yeah i would okay. try that service dev install command um yeah. And then rerun the doc script. Make sure the only one that changed is that operations. Um, yeah. And if not, then I can pull it down and, and go from there. But I think, uh, oh, this is not the right one. Um, let's see. Were there anything else here? I think uh, is the U or the URL isn't used anywhere, is it? Yeah. So I think that's fine then. I think it should be. Is it? I don't know. Let's see. View file. Oh. Okay. Valid git repository URL. URL directory. Uh, Repo.url. Yep, that's it. Okay, yeah. So that, I mean, that should make this pull request pass here. Okay. Um, and then I guess. Well, I think the other thing is the Git repository checked out. Does it use the commit anywhere? Dot commit. It may not use it anywhere. Yeah. Okay. It doesn't use it anywhere. Um, yeah. I think it's just in there to differentiate it as a different data type because it's a different thing. Yeah. Okay. So this should, I mean, it should pass after this, which would be good. Um, okay, sure. Uh, yeah, and also, we'll uh, out. after this, I don't have any other tasks to work on. Okay. So, like, 
like do you have any issue that's not really urgent and i can take yeah yeah that would be great i appreciate that um let's see because like you know work has been hectic so i can't really commit to like strict deadlines yes so, yes i understand i, I understand yeah. yeah that's been me i've i've been pulled on to other <laughs> things at the moment and so i'm like trying to do this in my free time as much as i can or well i've always been trying to do this in my free time as much as i can <laughs> but <laughs> but you know i unfortunately haven't had as much time at work um but i'm hoping i can get some more solid back in here um <laughs> Let's I think see. you should block more time in your calendar like Yeah, I should, yeah. Get time to work. <laughs> Auto convert definitions. Okay, that's the one we were just doing. Um let's see, let's see, let's see. Um that one's done. I'll I'll think about it because there's a lot here and I'm yeah. I'm trying to figure out which ones are Oh, this might be good actually. Um this one we remember when we did all the label where we added the labels to the sources yeah. yash i remember yash said you know label has machine learning meetings meanings huh. um we should we should change it to tag um so <laughs> if that that would be a good one um okay because i know that has confused a couple people <laughs> at least so that will be good sweet sure I'll do that. Yeah. all right all right well is there anything else guys or well for once we're actually Daddy. done okay no uh, can you explain a bit on uh, like what you? Uh, oh, the, you oh, I'm sorry. That's right. I had a feeling I was getting sidetracked there. Okay. Um, I knew there was. I was like, I went. I came to explain this for some reason. Okay. So the deal with that one is that the uh, so this the okay. So I don't know. I'm just going to give you guys a brief overview of how of how uh, website stuff works. Um, just in case you aren't familiar. Um, so. The way that most web UIs are written, there's, there's a couple ways to write websites, right? You can write, like, if you're familiar with PHP or Django or things like that, those are frameworks where um, the UI and the back end are very tightly coupled together. Um, and then there's, and, and that was sort of like historically, uh, up until a few years ago, uh, the way that most people were writing, well, probably up about like until seven years ago, is like when it really started to switch over. But when w how people of Ruby to uh, how people were writing web UIs is like the back end is very cu tightly coupled with the front end code, and the front end would be everything that you see and runs in JavaScript on your browser, and the back end is whatever's running on the server. Um, and recently, there's been this shift to where what we want to do is we want to create these like static uh, websites that you could deploy anywhere and then have have the um, and have the backend code be entirely decoupled, and what that allows you to do is you you define some sort of like you know you you, you pick some definition and you stick to it for the backend, right? Some sort of scheme that the front end is going to communicate with the backend over, and this is where things like REST and uh, and you know, like REST and the Open API definitions came from um, was people try to standardize what what are these you know how should we write a backend and how do we make it clear like what does the backend do so that it can be exposed to to the front end and you can swap out the front end code or you can swap out the back end code as long as you keep the way that they communicate the same right and so if I wanted to go from you know uh, an application that was written in Python to an application that was written in Go as the back end I could easily do that as long as I implement the same interface on the back end. Uh, you're not tied to any one particular framework like you previously had been with these tightly coupled back-end, front-end designs. Um, so that's that's the way that, that our HTTP service works and our web UI works. Is we have the web UI is a React application, and React is a very popular uh, JavaScript framework by Facebook. Um, and so basically what we're doing is... This is just a, you know, this is just a dumb website. Like it doesn't know how to do anything. Um, it it can't, you know. Eventually, we could actually use TensorFlow.js and stuff and do some stuff in the browser here. But right now, it doesn't do anything really, right? Like it just all it knows how to do is be the display for whatever the HTTP service does, right? And the HTTP service is the thing that actually interacts with all the code. You know, that's that that imports. DFFML and the DFFML plugins and actually runs them just like the command line application does um, or the command line interface does. And so what we need to do here is we're, we're exposing, we're just exposing all of the routes that we put in the HTTP uh, API, which is basically all of, all of these URL paths 
end up with like their own page. Um, and so right now, the authentication model for and the security for the HTTP API is pretty. It's very basic stuff. Um, basic is in it's it's not very usable by a wide audience. Like it's 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 kind of complicated how it actually works, but but it's basic in it's it's not something that you would ever see anywhere. Um, and so the thing is that HTTPS is commonly uh, so HTTPS used to mean SSL, and now we've moved off SSL to TLS, and that's just sort of like the underlying encryption uh, transport layer protocol that we use. Um, TLS stands for uh, SSL stands for socket. Uh, what was it like? Socket, socket, secure socket layer, and TLS tra stands for transport layer security. Um, and so with TLS, we have like the website certs here. So this is like, this is TLS right here is, is what you're seeing. And so you have the certificate of the website and the certificate is signed by some authority um, like DigiCert. Um, and so people pay these authorities or you can use Let's Encrypt um, to issue them a certificate for their website. And then those certificate authorities pay uh, people like Microsoft or Chrome, uh, Google to uh, add their root certificate, which is the certificate that signs the other certificates. Um, so basically, you generate your certificate for GitHub, and you say, hey, certificate authority, like, could you please sign this to say I'm really GitHub? And they're like, okay, you're really GitHub, like, I'll give you that certificate. Um, but we don't want to deploy every single website certificate to every single computer. So what we do is we trust only the the root certificates, um, the uh, which are things like VeriSign and DigiKey and Let's Encrypt, um, and we uh, so we add their certificates to everybody's computers. And that way, if someone's certificate is signed by one of the main certificates um, that exists out there that is installed on our computer, then we trust their certificate. Um, so we basically like we trust them by proxy because someone else trusts them. We trust whoever trusts them. Um, and so that's currently the way the web UI works is we create one of these certificates um, and we just use that one that we it's called self signing so we sign our own certificate um, because we're and and if you wanted to then have this actually show up as like a green check mark or a green you know uh, lock in the browser you'd have to install that certificate to your computer um, uh, but without without the uh, green or without installing it you have to basically manually specify kind of like what's what we're doing here is we're manually specifying this is the the ca that i trust uh, the certificate authority which is those people like uh, verisign and those people who sign other people's certificates right so we generated that one and so we're going to specify manually because we don't want to add it it's too complicated to add it to the system trust store um and then the other thing that we can do with these ca certificates is that we can we can do what's called mutual uh, or TLS client auth uh, or like mutual or it's not really mutual, but client auth basically means that. So the way that it works is that you the client verifies the identity the identity of the server by checking if it's you know if it has one of those root CAs that that it trusts in its in its store locally right and so here's that's where why we specified this one because we're saying this is your local store that you should look at for trust and it's we just give the one that we we generated right and self-signed um, and now what you can also do is you can say hey server when a client can connects I want you to make sure that the client also provides you with a certificate. And so the server can verify the client's certificate. Um, and so that's that's what we do here is we're, we've, we've done this very naive method of, of authentication just by saying, okay, everybody who wants to connect to the server when it's in secure mode um, has to have one of these client certificates. So the client verifies the server, check, and now the server has to verify the client because or else, you know, anybody can connect to anything, and this is about to run a bunch of arbitrary, you know, data flows or machine learning commands or pull from various data sources, and you don't want that stuff to be, you know, run by anybody on the internet. You you really need to be authenticated for that, right? If you're going to stand this up on some public server, um, 
And so this is all well and good, right? Um, but the thing is, that's not very usable um, because now everybody who connects to my server needs one of these client keys. So I have to generate, if I have any friends who want to go look at my models or like, you know, run a quick thing on my server that I have stood up, I need to go generate them a key and give them that key, right? These client.pam and client.key, I need to go give them those things. Um, and then they have to install them or they also have to install the root CA of their server um, so that their machine trusts it and yada, yada, yada. It's, it's a huge pain, right? So it, it works okay for development or if you're doing one-off stuff, but you know where we're going, where we're trying to make this stuff super usable, it's not, it's not going to be great, right? We need super usable. Um, so what we're going for here is basically, and I think I can show you this flow um, real quick here, deepsource.io. Um, so let's see. Uh, what we're going to try to do here with this OpenID Connect stuff is you guys have probably seen where you do like um, you go to start analysis, right? So this is just some random OAuth flow. These people are like, hi, you know, uh, we uh, we see that or well, I guess I'm already sort of logged in here. God damn it. All right, let me try or well, I won't be logged in GitHub. But basically, this is the kind of thing where it's like sign in with Google or connect with GitHub. Right, and then it'll redirect you to GitHub, and it'll say, "Hey, like you want to authorize this application," and then you say yada yada, and you click next, right? And it says, "Okay, like this this application can now see your email address, right?" And we are, you know, the random application asking GitHub to give us someone's email address in this case, right? And the reason why we're doing this is because we don't want to run our own databases of usernames and passwords, right? Everybody who's using this probably has a GitHub account or a Google account or a Microsoft account. And so what that library is going to let us do is leverage the fact that other people have accounts other places. So um, so what we can do is just say, hey, like, can you just let us know that you do have an account somewhere so that we can differentiate you from other people, right? And, this, and, and that way what it'll do is it'll redirect them to that sign-in page or authorization page and they say, hey, and Google says, hey, like, do you want to give this application permission to view your email address? They say yes. And we then say, okay, like we know you are someone with an email address, right? We can now let you do X, Y, Z, right? So, so if you maybe stand up the server and you say only let email address blank connect, um, right? You know, like agin at gmail.com. And then if they go through the authentication flow and they choose Google and it says, okay, this is, you know, this, this is uh, bill at gmail.com. You're going to say, Hey, that's not, um, you know, Google didn't Google, Google didn't say you're Ogden at gmail.com. So I'm not going to let you in. Right. If Google said you were Ogden at gmail.com, then all right, everything's fine. You can use the web UI or the back, the HTTP service, which will, you know, be, be the one uh, that accepts this token. Um, so, but did that kind of make sense? Uh, yeah. There's a lot of information. I'm sorry. Yeah, I, I was kind of watching a tutorial on this, okay. and that guy was also saying the same lines. Yeah, yeah. So this it sounds 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 reasonable then. Oh yeah. Okay. Yeah. Basically, the idea is that we'll say, you know, we just need somebody to manage accounts for us, right? Because we don't want to store usernames and passwords. Other people store usernames and passwords. You get into that, it's a mess. Um, also, it's nice because you can now integrate with uh, with uh, corporate, uh, like if you have some sort of internal corporate service or right, you're running some external service. Um, everybody everybody standing up their own username and password databases means uh, you know somebody can go steal everybody's username and password databases right you want to keep those the things that store usernames and passwords do a good job let's let them do it right um, and that's the point of the OAuth 2 and open ID connect and all that is basically delegate delegate the login style stuff to you know things that are meant to do login um, we don't need to write an application to do that um, yeah it's not hard to do that. It's not hard to hash passwords and stuff and accept them. It just means that, you know, now you need another account for another service, right? And you already have things that do that. It's let's, let's not mess with it. Right. Um, so from the perspective of like, okay, what do you do with this information? <laughs> um, the best thing to do here is to go, 
into, and I'll make a note of this in the issue, um, service HTTP do, 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 roots. Okay. Uh, source root. Okay. I think we have all the roots listed here. Okay, so this is the list of roots. Um, let me add copy permalink and let me let me add this in the issue here while we're at it and then we'll see if that's working now. Oh, still not working. All right, I'll check that out soon. Um, or wait, I didn't do anything. That's why it's still not working. <laughs> um, okay, Open ID Connect authentication. All right. So uh, you'll want to add the callback root here. So this is the list of roots, which basically just maps a URL to a method, right? And what you'll do is you'll take, you'll, um, you'll implement, you'll figure out how that stuff works. You'll start the HTTP server, right? And you'll have added your, you, you, you need to add a function that is similar to the rest of these functions here. And you don't want to decorate it with like the model context root and stuff like that, obviously, because it's not a model context thing. Um, but, you know, something like, uh, Something like the upload API might be a good one. Uh, configure source. One of these things. Like these are good examples for like how do I interact with you know how do how do I get the parameters that I need out of this URL and you know parse the JSON all that stuff, right? Um, so basically, you copy the structure of one of these methods. You add the URL path that the method should be accessible at um, to the uh, to the list of of URLs. And then you figure out, what you need to do is you need to figure out how do we use, where did that, oh, I got rid of that issue. Uh, the key is how do we figure out, where is that issue? I just had it. All right, whatever. Um, the key is how do we use these APIs here? Um, to create the right endpoint that we can, uh, that, that we will accept, uh, let's see, where is OSI callback GitHub? I think this is what it is. Um, basically, this is our base URL would be our server, right? And then this is the path that we register at our, or that method that you're going to write, right? And so when, when we send the we basically, we take the user um, and we redirect them to some URL um, for GitHub, right? And then when GitHub, uh, when GitHub, uh, when we finish the, the like confirm, when we, we click the authorize button or whatever on the GitHub website, it, we, we have provided some callback URL. And let me see if that deep source thing will work again. Um, Connect with GitHub. Ah, see, this is a different. It's a GitHub app. Um, yeah, I'm not really sure. Uh, I don't have a good I'll demo for you right now, but I'm sure you, you'll see something. Kind of a token or code. What? Uh, you get a kind of a, a token or some code. Back. Yeah, basically, basically, it. You you say you know. GitHub OAuth authorize, and then you you know like question back question mark callback URL equals, and then URL to your server, right? Mm -hmm. And then, and obviously that can't be local host. You're gonna have to do some port forwarding, or this might be like Gitpod or something. But you also you know you also don't have to mess with this issue if you don't want to. This is just something that would be it will be very cool. Um, so and then. Uh, and then what GitHub will do is it'll take that URL that it's supposed to redirect you back to or be the, the one that it's supposed to call when it's done authorizing. It's going to make the request to that URL and provide that URL with some information about the user. Um, I believe that's the flow, if I remember correctly. And then you take that and you say, oh, okay, like the user was authenticated by GitHub. I can use that token for them. Um, so GitHub will give you some token, and you say, "All right, now this is I, I accept this token as you know the proof that they can log in through GitHub." 
Um, okay. And that's it's 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 a bit of a simplification of what happens here, but but if you want to dive into this, you'll figure out more. Like it'll it'll become a, mm -hmm. sort of apparent. I imagine it will still be confusing. Um, but yeah, that's something that needs to happen so that we can sort of like uh, not deploy these these uh, these certificates in the way that in the way that we're doing. Um, we really just want to have like Let's Encrypt. Somebody grab their certificate from Let's Encrypt, which is a free TLS certificate provider. Um, you know, they stand it up on their you know whatever their VM is somewhere, and then they put in the URL into the web UI, which we host off of the the docs website. And they can authenticate to GitHub, and and you know they, it's all just sort of done for them, right? Um, we want to make it easy. Um, let's see. Uh, uh, let's see. Let's see. Yeah, I think that's. I think yeah, I think that's really all I have to say about that right now. Um, but of course, like this is kind of like this is going to be an it, in the weeds issue. Um, it, it, it won't be quick. Um, it'll be a lot of learning. You're going to learn a lot of very important stuff if you want to do it. Um, stuff that you'll probably use for a while. Um, but, but, you know, it's not going to be easy. Um, the other things that... I'll mess with the weekend and if I can't do it by then, I'll tell you. I'll okay, tell you. cool, cool. Yeah, I kind of think it might take a while. Um, just, but, but yeah, if, if it, it, it's basically just like the the tricky part is going to be learning how does that flow work and how do I actually use that flow to do something right um, and how do I integrate it with the with the the HTTP service that exists right um, and then other other things other than that is uh, let's see well I'd have to think about it um, and of course you always you guys know how to how to do the sort by um, have you guys used this to find issues has this been helpful the like medium time to complete and stuff like that yeah i haven't actually used it i usually go through the issues okay uh, we only have two pages or three pages yeah that's true okay yeah so it's always easy to find things that's that's good okay um yeah i've just i think this is probably more helpful for people who are just jumping onto the project um but i also haven't really noticed any of the people that i told us about stick around so i don't know we'll see i'm gonna keep doing it um and if you guys add issues i don't know if you have permissions to add labels too um but you can always just tell me and i'll i'll uh, i'll add the label to it if you think if you have a you know a label that you think it should be all right sweet um i think you know i think we're uh, i think we're making some great progress here um so yeah thanks guys okay um john do you have a minute yeah uh, yeah yeah so i ran the dfml service command service dev install but it's saying not implemented error currently you need to have at least the main package already installed in development mode but git pod should already have it installed in development mode right yeah that's weird um let's check yeah. out the git pod script maybe it wasn't installed so, in development mode or maybe it just I, yeah see okay try just try running this command again then um uh, i did the pip install uh dev one like minus u dev one oh oh okay this is this is something that that was a gotcha that happened in the uh in the contributing documentation a few months ago uh justin caught um the dash e has to go be the the argument that it's directly in front of the path that you want to install um that might be the case here because and, and if that is the case then you're going to need to uninstall dffml first so i would try uninstalling dffml um okay. and then try installing a development mode and that okay, that will sure. probably help okay sure yeah i'll do that and then i'll okay. i'll do this uh we'll see if we can yeah i'll just do that or uh let's see if plugin equals um export plugin equals model tensorflow um, sed dash i Echo plugin CD. Let me see if we can fix this real quick here. Uh, nope. Oops. 
har låtit sig för. Alright, okay, that should help us uninstall things. Vim. That's the I run. All right, so I'm gonna push this up and then hopefully. Okay, right, hopefully that will fix things here. Uh, if not, I think I think that should be the problem. So hopefully we get that TensorFlow stuff fixed soon. All right, okay. thanks guys. Okay. And just, of course, always on Gitter if there's anything else. And I'll uh, talk to you guys next week. Yeah. Have a good one. Bye. Bye, John.